First of all, it's my pleasure and honor to be here. And I look at everybody's face, face and I remember my time at college. And I couldn't wait to get out and go to the real world. And I'm in the real world. Every minute I think I said, what precious moment was college. <laughs> you remember that when you're in the real world, you don't think fast. <laughs> because you have a pure heart, you don't have any prejudice, and you have a freedom of the spirit. You could feel, you think it's true, you could feel it. It's much easier for you to do that than when you are in the real world, you have so much other uh, prejudices think of. I would like to tell you a couple of stories, a real story. Uh, after the revolution, around thir more than 13 members of my family were arrested, including two of my brothers, my two brothers, both of them were arrested. Their wife was arrested, as they have a baby, my oldest brother's wife had a baby, three month old baby, and was nursing him, breastfeeding him. And the National Guard said, take your baby to the prison too. There's no excuse. And she took the baby to prison. And she was there for seven years. And the thing that she was telling me the story put me to tears was that the first couple of years the guard would come there and she was in solitary. The guard, the door was a metal door. She would bang on the door and her name is Rezvan. I would say Rezvan, get blindfolded, I'm coming in. And she would get blindfolded, sit in the corner and then he would ask question and he give her a paper to sign that say that I'm not Baha'i. I'm not Baha'i, I'm a Muslim. And she would say, I don't, I'm not going to sign it because I'm a Baha'i. He would say, if you sign it, I release you right now and you can have anything you want. She said no. And he would get angry and had an electrical wire, he would hit her in the head. She said that was a routine. Every other week, every month, he would come over there and would do it. And she said, I was tired of it. And one day, he came over there and was hitting her with a wire. She had sunglasses and baby in her arm. And the end of the wire get in the side of the, her glass and throw her glass off in the corner, and the baby started screaming. The screaming, from then on, anytime he would come, in and bang on the door, the baby automatically would start crying. And then God would take the baby and give it to somebody else in the prison to keep it for half an hour for interrogation. <coughs> then one day she said that, I just was tired. When the guard came in, I said, listen. He would say, brother, come hit me and go. You have been constantly doing it to sign it. I'm not going to sign it. <coughs> we would sign it. I say I'm not a, I am not a Baha'i. I would be just like you. Don't have any dignity. Don't care about anything. I'm not worse than you. Therefore, I'm different than a Baha'i. <coughs> and we would get upset either more. Anyway, after a couple of months or years of continuing it, she said one day. She said, listen. Why don't you just hit me and hit me, whatever you want to do, and go, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Anything you ask me, I'm not going to answer. That is, that's fine, but I'm not going to answer you anything. And the guard left. Another month passed, the guard came again. And then this time, he was asking her question. She knew he has been reading some of the Baha'i writing, Baha'i book, because some of the Terminology is different. You should read it, you know. When you read the Bible, then you get a quote from the Bible, the, the way that you say it is different. He was reading from the Baha'i writing. She said, oh, uh, this time he asked me a question, I answered him anything, he didn't beat me, nothing, and he left. And then he came two, three times. And the last time he came, 
He knocked the door very gently. He knocked the door very gently, and I opened the door. I blindfolded, sit in the corner, and he came in and he said, she said, for a two minutes, I was so scared. I didn't know what is happening because I knew he's inside the cell, but he's not saying anything. And I cannot see anything, what's happening. And after a minute or so, he said, Rezvan, you cannot believe what you're going to hear from me right now. Rezvan said, what? The guard said, I have been reading, investigating the Baha'i writing. And I believe it, and I am the high, I'm going to resignate my job today. You are not going to see me anymore. And Rezvan said, listen, I'm in Baha'i, my wife is in, my husband is in prison, my child is in prison, you are torturing me, you be torturing me like that, why you want to become Baha'i? What is it? And what I have, she said, what I have done in my life, I haven't done anything. And the guard said, what else should you do? You should do. You open my eyes to the reality of life. I have been reading the book. I realized what you're saying is true. And the guard said, I'm going to leave this prison. And when you are released from prison, I'll come and I find you. And she said, I did not see him anymore. And that was the last time I saw him. I want to quote uh, the founder of my faith, of Jesus Christ, who said to love your neighbor as yourself. We articulate this as the golden rule. And so tonight, in being fidelity with my own conscience, I must say uh, to my brothers and sisters who have travel to be with us tonight, uh, that we all are uh, Baha tonight, and we all stand uh, and receive your witness of your struggle. And we thank you very much for sharing it uh, with us tonight. I receive it as a Christian and as a Baptist minister with keen knowledge of our own history in this country and how uh, my ancestors as Baptists were prosecuted, persecuted, and ran out of uh, the colonies, ran to, and run to the frontiers. Roger Williams was run out of Boston, founded Rhode Island in the first Baptist church in, the, in America. Uh, Baptists were routinely uh, denied education in this country were whipped and beat in public squares and arrested. As a matter of fact, uh, just uh, as, a, as one of the things that urged Thomas Jefferson to write in the Commonwealth's uh, Constitution, guarantees for religious freedom was his own experience in seeing Baptists persecuted. I receive your witness tonight as a black man whose own people uh, were denied education, uh, denied even the right to learn to read uh, as a condition to keep them in a system of oppression. As a black man himself who was in special education from first to third grade, it's part of a terrible system of tracking that existed in this country uh, and it was only ended by collective work of folks who stopped accepting that uh, and realized that even if it wasn't their child, it was their child. I receive your witness tonight as an attorney and one uh, who has been deeply inspired by the corrective work of attorneys to make real the promises of democracy and the promises of law itself. For law is a tool organized by the consent of the people to bring order and prosperity. And when injustice is enshrined in the law, in the authorities, it becomes a tool of chaos. Uh, 
Hosea Williams, a Baptist minister uh, who organized you know, many campaigns for the poor across this country and campaigns for uh, minorities, African Americans, uh, struggling to gain rights in this country. He's, he had this saying, and it's been paraphrased and taken and used, and that's part of the best of Baptist tradition to use others. So I will use Hosea Williams tonight. He, he would often end his, his sermons when folks would say, what does this have to do with me? In Statesboro, Georgia, what's happening in Iran? He, he would say to folks who were listening to his struggle about what was happening in Southeast Georgia, folks from New York or from Paris or around the world, who he was trying to galvanize support for the civil rights movement. He said, they came for the person down the street. I didn't say anything because it wasn't my business. They came for my neighbor next door and I didn't say anything because it wasn't my business. And when they came for me, there was no one left to say anything. And so, the worst treason is to be a traitor to your own conscience. And what you have heard tonight, regardless of what faith journey you're on, even if you call it a faith journey or recognize it as one, your conscience must be seared tonight by what we've seen and what we've heard. Don't betray that. Follow that. Investigate that. And add your collective voice to this great struggle, and we shall overcome.